afternoon, everybody. Trying to get things set up here. Hold on a sec. Is everybody doing well? The last week of January already. Can you believe that? Almost a month has gone by already in 2020. Wow, amazing. Next week is going to be uh, February 2nd, beginning of February, but we're already a month in. So, yeah, welcome to English service here at New Life Fellowship, 3 o'clock every Sunday. Uh, it's good to have you guys here today. What we've been talking about, excuse me, for the last month, we've been talking about growth. We're looking into 2020 and we're, we're talking about growth. The last few weeks we talked about different ways that we could grow. Uh, the first couple of weeks we spent talking about uh, Psalms chapter 1, be like a tree planted by rivers of living water that brings forth fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatever it does shall prosper. And we're like, yes, I want to be like that tree. I want to be like that tree that's prospering, that's planted, that's fruitful. No matter when the hot seasons or the dry seasons come, it doesn't matter. My leaves, my leaves, the fruit keeps coming. Why? Because it's right by the river. We also talked uh, about... Temptation. We talked about the first verse of uh, Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. So we talked about how we can continue to grow by staying away from temptation, from living in the word of God, having victory in temptation through the word of God, just like Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness. We also, last week, we had Pastor Angie preach about uh, the sitting at the table and partaking of God's goodness and not letting the enemy sit at the table next to us, but sitting at the table even in the presence of our enemies, like it says in Psalms chapter 23. Today we're going to talk about, we're going to continue talking about growth for one more week. Like I said, uh, when we were doing the announcements next week, we're going to talk about uh, the Vision, Vision Sunday, 2-2-2020. Two, two, uh, it's going to be a great time. So, uh, and so this week is going to be the last week for our series on growth. We're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. And I want to talk about a story in the Bible. And it's a story that all of us know. And most kids would know this story too. It's kind of one of those ones that's kind of a classic kid's story in the Bible. But... It's a real-life story, and uh, it has some very, very good points in it. And at the end, I want to bring out a few points, but I want you to remember, we're going to have you ask important questions, important questions that can help you grow in your life. The story that I'm talking about is the story of Jonah. How many people have heard the story of Jonah? All right, good. All right, most of you guys have, have heard the story of Jonah already. It's kind of a, a little bit of a different story. It's obviously one of the, um, it's one of the prophets in the Bible. It's a little bit different from the rest of the prophets in the Bible because it's not so much about the prophecies. Like if you read Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and it talks about this is the prophecy against you know, this country, this is the prophecy against this country, this is the prophecy against this country. In the book of Jonah, there is, it's not so much about the prophecy, but it's about the prophet. And so it's talking about his life. And there is a prophecy, and it's only one sentence. That, you know, in the whole book, there's only one prophecy, it's one sentence, and the prophecy didn't come true. So we'll look at that in just a minute. But let me kind of set the stage. This is the story of Jonah. Can we have, there we go. Okay, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son, of, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Okay, I want you to, I don't know if you have that highlighter in your Bible, highlight that one line. He fleed from the presence of the Lord. Okay? He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So it's emphasizing 
two times here. From the presence of the Lord. Away from the presence of the Lord. Okay. I don't know what Jonah's life was like before this story. Obviously, he was a prophet receiving the words of God. He probably was a prophet to the people of Israel. That's where he was, his, he was living. But then God said to him, go to Nineveh. Okay. Now, you have to know, Nineveh was way far east from where Jonah was. It was kind of north and east from where he was. And, and Jonah gets the word from God, chooses to flee from the presence of the Lord and say, God, no thanks. I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going to go to Tarshish. Tarshish was west. He says, God, you want me to go this way? No thanks. I'm going to go this way. Now, Tarshish was not just kind of like the next door neighbor to Israel. Tarshish, if you know where Israel is and kind of the geography of the Mediterranean Sea, basically Tarshish would be in Spain, near, uh, near, the, near the Atlantic Ocean, that far away from, um, from where Israel was. It was so, so far away. There's another verse in 1 Kings that does actually talk about Tarshish. Uh, in 1 Kings 10, verse 22. Talking about, the, talking about King Solomon. Now, King Solomon was one of the wisest, or he was the wisest, probably the wisest man in the Bible. He was blessed by the Lord. He said, God, give me wisdom to lead the people of yours. And so God gave him wisdom. <coughs> and through that wisdom, God said, because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to bless you with all the other stuff too. And so he was probably the most wealthy person. I, I, I don't have all the stats to prove it, but he was, he was probably the wealthiest even in today's standards and measures. But he would always send out his ships to different places all over the world and come back with all sorts of treasures and stuff, gold, silver, all that stuff. 1 Kings 10.22 says, For King Solomon had a fleet of ships, not just one ship. This is a fleet of ships. It says, A fleet of ships of Tarshish at sea with the fleet of Hiram. Once every three years, the fleet of ships of Tarshish used to come used to come, bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. So all of these exotic things coming back from Tarshish. Gold, silver, ivory, apes. I don't know what they did with the apes. Maybe, had, maybe uh, Solomon started a zoo or something. I don't know. But uh, he had all these things coming back from Tarshish. And so I kind of wonder... What Jonah was thinking, maybe I'll get away from all this. Let's uh, you know, find the furthest, furthest place away that I can actually go. Let's go to Tarshish. I've heard lots of stuff, good stuff coming out of Tarshish. They have gold and silver and peacocks and apes and all sorts of stuff. Let's go check it out. Get away from this Nineveh place. I don't know what he was thinking. We can only assume. But this, this was Tarshish. This is, where, this is where Jonah decided to go. So we all know what happened. He gets in the boat, and there's a big storm that comes. <coughs> and they're all, and Jonah is asleep down in the bottom of the boat. And so all of the sailors, they're fighting the wind and the waves and trying to keep the boat afloat. And so they go down to see Jonah, and he's sleeping way down in the bottom of the boat. So they go, hey, Jonah, wake up. Get up here. Help out. We need your help, you know, pulling the ropes or, you know, manning the sail or whatever. And Jonah knew what was going on. He said, he probably said to himself, said, oh, I'm in big trouble now. God sent this storm just for me. I'm supposed to be going this way, but instead I'm going this way. And now all these people's lives are at risk. So then he gets up and they're all praying to their gods and they're all trying to fix this and trying to fix that. But then Jonah says to them in verse 9 to 10, we have it up on the screen there. He said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Obviously, he didn't fear God enough to go to Nineveh, but then he started fearing him a little bit more when the storm came. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said, what is this that you have done? The men knew that he was fleeing, where? From the presence of the Lord. So this is the third time. The third time we see Jonah running away from the presence of the Lord. He's trying to get away because he had told them, 
I don't know when he told them, but he told them, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm try, trying to get away from God. I would have said to them, oh, you go back and you listen to your God. Don't, be, don't, don't risk my life for what you're doing. So then, then he, they, they throw him overboard. He gets swallowed by a great big fish. And he's alive down in that, fi down in that fish for three days and three nights. And he prays from the fish to God, I messed up. You are the God above all gods. I'll obey. And then three days later, you know, Jonah hits the, uh, hits the beach, covered in, in whale puke and uh, barnacles and all sorts of stuff probably. And, and uh, so then he decides to go. Um, but he still kind of had a, bad, a little bit of a bad attitude. Even after he was uh, out, of the, out of the whale, the word of the Lord came and, and uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah and says in chapter 3, it says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. So to travel from one side to the other, three days. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And then he called out. Okay, so this is the, the prophecy of Jonah right here. Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That was the sum total of Jonah's entire prophecy. Forty days more, and Nineveh's no more. Forty days more, and Nineveh's no more. Not exactly the uh, most seeker-sensitive or the most uh, uh, kind-hearted sort of evangelistic message. He's, he just goes into the city, all right, you guys are doomed. Forty more days, you're done for. Forty more days, you're done. Can you imagine? I'd be like, who is this guy? Coming and, and uh, proclaiming doom and gloom and all that sort of stuff. The crazy thing that happened is people took his word seriously. Here was a guy from, you know, a long ways away, not even a part of the city or anything like that. Coming in and saying, all right, 40 more days, you're done for, 40 more days. <clears throat> but then, listen to this, this is crazy. The people believed God. The people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Okay, now sackcloth is always the uh, typical mourning clothes uh, for when you're mourning in the Bible. Uh, it's itchy, it's not very comfortable. Uh, it reminds people of their humility. And every time you hear them talking about um, sackcloth, it's always um, has to do with mourning and stuff. Now listen to this. This is in Jonah chapter 3, verse 6. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. This is the king. He issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast nor herd, nor flock, taste anything. Okay? This is the king. Nobody's going to taste anything. Not even your dogs, not even your cows or your chickens or anything. Nobody gets to eat. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Go put, go put some sackcloth on your cows and on your horses and on your chickens and on your dogs. This is what he's saying. Ever, even, even the cows. I was like, what are you doing? You know, the cows. Yeah, I'm going out to put some sackcloth on my cow. Let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? May God turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. The people of Nineveh heard the judgment was coming, and they took it more seriously. They took the word of God even more seriously than Jonah did. Jonah's like, no thanks, God, I'm going the other way. You tell me to go this way, I'm going to do it, go this way. But then when the people of Nineveh heard it, like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Everybody's fasting, even my dogs and my cats. Nobody gets to eat. They wanted to do it. They, they wanted to do it so badly that they did it right. And they said, maybe God, who knows, maybe God will relent. The funny part of the story is that 
is Jonah's attitude through it all. Here he was, the most successful evangelist probably in the whole Old Testament, a whole city. It says later on in the, chap in the, in the book, it says that there was 120,000 people in Nineveh, and they all turned to God just like that. He was, Jonah was the most successful evangelist probably in the Bible, okay? But he was mad. He had a bad attitude. So he sees all this, and then he sees God turn because of God's mercy and compassion. Chapter 4, verse 1. Listen to what it says. We have it up on the screen here. Oh, do we have verse 1 on there? No, oh, I guess we don't have verse 1. I'll read verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. So he saw what happened. He proclaimed judgment. They turned. God didn't destroy the city. And Jonah was mad. He was mad. He said, come on, God. Come on. Why did you have to do all this? It displeased him, and he was very angry. Okay, and then verse 2, it says, And he prayed to God. Can we put? Yeah, and he prayed to, get to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He knew who his God was. He knew that God was gracious and merciful, relenting from disaster. But he wanted to see Nineveh get theirs. But he obeyed and he, he did it. He, he said the word of God. And so, obviously, there was some proper understanding about God, but there's a rotten attitude inside of him there. And then, and then you hear, and then the rest of the story is Jonah goes out of the city, sits up on a hill somewhere overlooking the city, and it says that he was waiting for the disaster of the city to come. And so he was up there, and he was waiting, and it didn't come, and he was getting angry. But as he was waiting, <clears throat> he made a little booth for himself. He was sitting up there and made a little tent for him. And as he was there, God caused a vine to grow up over top. And it shaded him. And he was, like, he was like, oh, I'm so happy. But then the next day, there was a worm that came and ate the vine. And, uh, and then it shriveled up and, and uh, dried up and blew away. And then he was mad again. So here you see Jonah flip-flopping back and forth, attitudes and, and, and weird stuff happening. And then let's read the, the last verses here, uh, Jonah 4, verses 10 to 11. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. So God was saying, you, you feel sorry for this plant because you weren't comfortable. It made you a little bit uncomfortable. But here's 120,000 people. 120,000 people who don't know their right. Basically, God's saying they don't know what they're doing is wrong. They don't know their right hand from their left hand. They're, they were Assyrians were a violent, war-mongering group of people. And they would just go and they would just slaughter people. The whole nation of Israel was given over to the Assyrians and then Judah later to the, ba uh, to the Babylonians. But they were very, very violent, violent people. And I don't know if there was some sort of uh, animosity in Jonah's heart towards them or maybe there was a little bit of hatred and maybe some racism going on there. I don't know. But God wanted to show his kindness and mercy to the Ninevites and to the people of Assyria. And Jonah knew that, but he still had some sort of attitudes and stuff. So, all of that to lead us into how can we grow by looking at Jonah's story? How can we grow? And my main point here, I have a few other sub points, but my main point here is living a life of humility before God will help us to grow. Jonah... He had his own thoughts, his own feelings, and his own desires. And he had what he thought should be the right way. And because of those things, it led to anger. 
it led to him being disappointed because of, what, of the mercy that God was showing. And it gave him an ungodly perspective of the Ninevites. It gave him the selfishness that he had gave him a wrong perspective into what God was doing. God wanted to show his grace and mercy. God wanted to show how he was compassionate towards them. But Jonah, he, he couldn't see that. The first thing that we can learn from Jonah, and the first step in humility, is make the presence of the Lord a priority. Three times we saw Jonah running away from the presence of the Lord. One of the best ways that you can continue to grow and to continue to keep your heart right before God is to stay in the presence of God. Stay in the presence of God. Obviously, this means coming to church, worshiping with a, with a heart full of gratitude and, and openness and honor to God. But it also means spending time with God on a regular basis, allowing Him to be a part of every part of your lives. You know, I always say, this is my thing, is that God doesn't want just to be number one priority in your life. When we think of priority lists, we think of, okay, this is obviously God's number one, and then family, and, you know, da-da-da-da-da, you're going down. I don't think that God wants that so much. I don't, God doesn't want to, think, want, want to be thought of as number one on the list. We check off every day, okay, I did that, now I can go and do the stuff that I really want to do. Uh, no, God doesn't, God doesn't want it like that. I believe that the way that God wants us to think of our priorities is like, a, is like a pie. And you can split it all up. You know, you have like the pie chart and you have this much time for work, this much time for sleep, this much time for, I don't know, spending time with your friends and family, this much time for this, this much time for that. And it's like a pie chart with all the different triangles in it. I don't think that God wants to be just one of the triangles of your life. God wants to be the whole pie. God wants to be the whole pie. You know, you can have like an apple pie, and it's an apple pie. You just get this little, this, this piece of it. God wants us to have a God pie in our life. Okay, well, when you're spending time at work, it's with God right there in the center of it. When you're with your family and your friends, it's with God right there, right in the center of it. And so, yeah, of course, you want to spend time reading the Bible. You want to spend time worshiping and praying. But every part of our lives is meant to be with God in the center of it, right? So, so it's not, the presence of God is not just about coming here on the Sundays. Don't, don't ever stop coming to the presence of God. Don't ever stop coming to church. It's where we get fed, uh, fed and fueled up and we can... Uh, meet with our, our, our Christian brothers and sisters, but make God and the presence of God a priority in every section of your life. So number one, make the presence of the Lord a priority. Number two, be humble. Be humble in your life. Whenever someone gets proud and thinks that they know it all, they immediately stop growing. They can't grow spiritually if you're proud. Because pride says, that's all right, I got it. I got it all figured out. And you can't learn anymore when you're thinking like that. You can't just, you can't receive from people. You can't think, yes, I've, I've arrived, I've, I'm there. You know, that's your ceiling right there. That's your, you're, you're creating a ceiling for yourself. You can't grow past that because you've chosen to believe that, that, that you can't grow anymore. And so don't, so just... Always have a humble spirit. Always have a humble spirit. God, search me. Try my ways. See if there is anything. Someone points something out to you. Maybe it hurts a little bit, but take it to the Lord and say, okay, God, what is, what is it really? What is this that's going on in here? What is this that you want to do in me through this? Humility is the key to constantly growing in your life. Realizing who you are, who God is, and who we are to be in relationship to each other.
ask the right, the next point is that we need to ask the right questions in every situation. There's a few key questions that we can ask that will help us in every situation that we're in. Every, every time that we face difficult things in life or even good things in life, we can ask ourselves these questions. First question, what does God want to teach me about himself through this? What does God want to teach me about myself through this? Or teach me about himself through this? Maybe there's something that happens in your life and you just really don't understand it. And the, the, the humble question is to say to God, God, what do you want me to learn about yourself through this? What are you doing? What, what, are, the, what are the things that are important to you in this, in this situation? You know, it talks about the Bible. In the Bible, it talks about different people who knew not just the the actions of God or the ways or not just the the things that God has done the stories of God but they knew the ways of God meaning they understood the why behind the things that God was doing and God wants us to be like that as well God wants to reveal himself to us in the situations that we face on a daily basis God God is a God who reveals himself to us we see that all through the Bible. Okay? God wants to reveal himself to you. God wants you to know him. And we are limited people. I can't go outside of this body. I can't be in two places at once. I can't go and search the heavens for God. God has to come to us. And that's what he does do. He reveals himself in nature. He reveals himself through the word of God. He came as a man, Jesus, to walk on this earth to show us his ways. He reveals himself to us. But God wants to reveal himself to you on a daily basis. And a lot of times the way it happens is through the situations of our lives. God has something to show to you about himself through the situations of your life. Next question we can ask, what does God want to teach me about myself through this? Now, this is a dangerous question. This is a dangerous question to ask because God will answer it. God will show you the things that are in your life that are usually kind of icky. We don't like them. You know, if you face a certain... For example, a temptation of some sort. Ask yourself, God, why am I facing this temptation? Well, it could be because you have a wrong thought process or wrong values that God wants to shape and change and alter. And so if you ask the right questions and God shows it to you, then we can say, okay, look, God, help me to change in this area. Our emotions are, usually, are very, very good indicators of wrong priorities in our lives. Sometimes, okay, I'll give you an example from my personal life. There was something that was happening, and uh, just recently somebody was going to give me something. And when I first heard about it, I was excited. I was happy, okay? And then I got it, and it wasn't exactly what he said he was going to give to me. And then I'm disappointed. And then and then, and then so I, I talked to him about it, and he said, okay, I'm going to give you this again. And then, so my emotions were going up and down like this, and it was just all sorts of crazy. And I'm like, God, what's going on here? And so I asked God, I said, okay, God, what do you want to teach me about this through my emotions? So our emotions reveal, you know, what's inside. And God showed me that there was too much of a emphasis, too much of a value on certain things, on material things. And so, you know, you have to repent before God. God, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for allowing that to be the, the driver of my emotions. God doesn't want things to be the driver of our emotions. He wants to be the source of our love, source of our joy, source of our peace. And so even in, in little situations and circumstances like that, we can see that 
God wants to show us things through the situations that we face. Show us about ourselves, help us to grow through those things. Jonah, going back to the story of Jonah, we can see through his emotions that there was some flawed thinking and flawed values through, through his anger, through his priority of himself over the Ninevites. Uh, we can see that there was things that were going on that were wrong inside of him. Rather than being humble and submitting to God and say, God, I want what you want. My values are your values. Shape me, mold me, make me more like you. He said, oh man, strike him down. That wasn't God's heart at all. And the last question, how can I use what I learned about myself to change and to be more like God? The Word of God, God and the Word of God is our straight line ruler. In school, you get a ruler to draw straight lines or to measure things. God is our ruler. When we ask the question, God, what do you want to show me about yourself? We see the straight line. Sometimes when we ask the question, God, what do you want to show me about me? We look at our, our line and it's kind of all crooked like that. When we measure the straight line to our crooked line and say, God, I want to match up more like you. And so that's what we need to do. We need to be humble and say, God, every day I haven't arrived yet. I'm not there. I have weaknesses. I have wrong values. Help me to grow just a little bit more today, maybe through this situation or that situation. Maybe it's a conversation that you have with somebody. It could possibly even be an argument that you have with somebody. God's showing you those things that are not right in your life. Humble yourself and, you know, apologize if you need to apologize. But ask God, God, what is it? What are these things that you want to show me? And grow and be committed to that growth. Be committed to God and say, God, your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Help me to be more like you each and every day. Don't be like Jonah. Don't run away. Don't flee from the presence of God. But humbly, humbly live before God. And you'll see your life continue to grow. Because these are questions that God answers. God is a God who, who, who loves to see us grow. He doesn't just... Oh, you figure it out by yourself. I'll let you to, you know. He's, no, he's, he's not like that. He's intimate. He's part of our lives every day. And he wants to show you these things because he's a good, good God. And he loves us very much. Amen? We were created as people who bear the image of God. That's who he made us to be. Each and every one of us is meant to live with the image of God. And so... He'll be faithful to help us to do that. You make that a priority, he'll be faithful. He'll be like, yeah, I'm there for you. Let's do this. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to immediately be like God 100%. No, just step by step each and every day. Just be faithful to the process, and God will be faithful to come through for you. Amen? Let's stand up together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you know you are intimate with every part of our lives. You know what we face, the good, the bad. You know everything. You know our thoughts, even before we have them, God. You know them. You know the words that we're going to speak. You know the situations that we're going to face. It's not a surprise to you, God. God, help us to be people who are committed to growth. Put that desire in us every day. Sometimes we can have lazy days where we don't want to do it, but God, sometimes there are situations that we face where we just need to say, God, show me. What is this inside of me that I'm feeling this way or thinking this way or, or doing this or saying this? What is it? God, I thank you that you are faithful. I pray for each person here in this room today. God, that you would help them to grow more and more and more like you. Set your spirit upon them. Remind them who they are. They are created to be image bearers of Jesus. To live your way 
and it's not something that's empty or hopeless, but God, you have blessed us with your Holy Spirit. You tore the veil. When Jesus died on the cross, you tore the veil so that we can come in. You said, Jesus, if I, Jesus said, if I go up to heaven, I'll send the Holy Spirit to you. The Holy Spirit is with us each and every day to bring us life and strength, help, comfort, everything that we need. So God, today as a group, we commit to you. We commit to you. We commit to growth. We commit to your ways because your ways are higher than our ways. Shape us, God. Mold us. Make us into the men and women of God that you have created us to be that we can grow and be more like you each and every day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. If you, any of you guys have any prayer requests, at the end of every service, we have our prayer team, our leadership team, our prayer team up at the front. If you guys have any prayer requests, come on up. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to join faith together with you and see God bring a breakthrough to you. If not, have a great week. Have a great evening, and we'll see you guys all next week. Don't forget, next week, 2-2-2020, we're going to have our Vision Sunday next week. God bless you. Amen.